Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to continue to highlight the ways our communities are addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion through these conversations with our local organizational leaders. Today, we have Idowu Odudesu, who is the Executive Director of the Stevens Point Housing Authority. And we're excited to welcome her and have her share some of the work that she has done previously, as well as what's happening in Stevens Point now. So welcome, Ido. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you would like to start out by just sharing a, a little bit about your background um, and tell us how you came to Stevens Point and found yourself in this role of executive director. Okay, yeah. So a little bit about my background is that I have many years of experience working in community and economic development. So prior before coming to Stevens Point House and Authority, I worked actually um, for the New York City House and Authority as an assistant director. I specifically worked in a department called, it's a long department name, but it's Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability. Um, the goal was to increase income and assets for low and moderate income individuals that live in public housing in New York City. I did that for a number of years, eight years in total. And I specifically focused on financial literacy programs um, and entrepreneurship slash business development programs um, for low income individuals. We also ran two, within that we ran two accelerate, business accelerator programs. One was a childcare um, business accelerator program to help low income women who were interested in starting their own business um, by being a home based child care provider. And the second business accelerator program um, that I helped facilitate and coordinate was the Food Business Pathways program, which helps um, NYCHA residents, New York City Housing Authority, that's the acronym for NYCHA, who are interested in starting their own food business or catering business. Um, and I moved to Stevens Point, Central Wisconsin. I know vastly different from New York City, but I moved here for personal reasons um, and for professional reasons um, as well. Um, my partner lived in Central Wisconsin for 20 years. Um, so we were thinking, you know, who was the most, he didn't necessarily want to come to New York. And I was also open to leaving New York. So I moved to Central Wisconsin right before the pandemic started. So in a way, it kind of all worked out not being in a, in a big city during, during a pandemic. Um, and an opportunity came, um, came, came across with Stevens Point House and Authority because the previous executive director was retiring. Um, so, and that's kind of how that happened. And I've been in Stevens, well, I actually live close in, in, in Cronenweather, which is close to CWA and I work in Stevens Point, but I've been here since January of 2020. Um, so Stevens Point House and Authority is a public housing um, agency, um, which is funded by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is called HUD for short. And the mission um, of HUD is to provide um, affordable housing, also home ownership opportunities, but affordable housing to low and moderate income individuals throughout the United States um, and Puerto Rico as well. Um, so Stevens Point, we manage 247 public housing units within the city of Stevens Point. Um, and the benefit of um, residing or tenants who reside with the Stevens Point Housing Authority is that your rent is based on your income. So it's very affordable. No public housing resident across the nation pays no more than 30% of their income on rent. Um, and another benefit as well, um, which has been relevant to people affected by the pandemic is that if your income decreases, you can also have your rent adjusted downward to reflect that new income decrease. So that's something that people who rent in the private market, they don't have that benefit. Um, and that's just a little bit about Stevens Point Housing Authority and what we do locally here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, yeah, having that benefit of, of having your, your housing costs adjusted for your income, whether that's going up or down is, is really significant, especially most people um, had to deal with an income decrease that was pretty significant in mm -hmm. those 18 months potentially. So that's great. Um, exactly. I, I love some of the things and I've had a chance to chat with you before mm -hmm. so I knew a little bit about some of the work that you had done in New York and, and I just love the financial literacy and the business accelerator program. Mm -hmm. um, 
what what aspects of the work that you did in New York do you think that you're able to bring in and potentially even replicate in Stevens Point? Or is that something that you would want to do? Yeah, definitely. I Because of the pandemic in 2020, we didn't focus as much on interacting with tenants in person. Obviously, we encourage tenants to, to call us. Um, but as things start to get back to normal or whatever this new normal looks like, um, that's something that I'm looking forward um, to implementing, implementing more resident services program. One thing that I learned about recently, um, Sherry Daniels, she has the financial wellness of Portage County. Um, so I've informed my staff, if there are tenants that they come across that are having trouble paying rent, um, that's one resource for them locally. We also have a, a program with CAP services where we um, fund the Hoover program, which is the home ownership, I believe reserve account, which provides 0% down payment and closing costs um, um, alone as interest-free um, to anyone who meets their income requirements. So that's something that I've been having discussions uh, with CAP services about and that we're trying to encourage tenants to who are interested in home ownership, if, if that's the next step for them to, to take a look into that program. But definitely financial literacy um, is a huge thing because we do come across tenants who have trouble paying rent. So that's something that we want to facilitate more and also just in general, hopefully being able to assist tenants with other economic development programs, such as maybe obtaining, um, finishing their, their high school or GED, um, going, obtaining, you know, maybe their associate's degree and maybe future or a bachelor's degree. Um, so those are additional programs that we're trying to um, look into and also reaching out to the community college as well and figuring out what other adult education programs that they have. And every time we come across different services that we think are relevant to our tenants, we at least inform them that these are the programs um, that, that are available to you and to take advantage of them. And uh, hopefully as things get back to normal, we hope to do more like resident workshops and resident info sessions um, and just more programs in general to help our tenants um, that live in public housing, you know, improve um, their economic situation. Those resident services, I think, are, are so key and, and something that I don't think most people would associate with what the housing authority um, does or can do. And I love that you you referred to some of the partnerships and collaborations. We just had Nicole Harrison from CAP Services with us okay. yesterday. So we had the opportunity to talk about some of the things that they're doing and, and recognizing how these various organizations and agencies can be working together to serve mm -hmm. our community. Exactly. Um, exactly. And we do have our financial literacy certificate through UWSP. So some of our students have been working on that because financial literacy is something near and dear to their hearts. So another mm -hmm. opportunity, students, if you have perked up when you heard that, an opportunity to potentially connect with Ido um, to maybe do some practicum and, and do some um, mm -hmm. programming in the near future, that would be a fabulous opportunity. So I love that. Um, as you're, you're thinking about the, the various individuals that you serve, so you said, I think it was 247 units. Yes. Uh, you have very unique individuals in all of those mm -hmm. places and the types of um, housing as well as the types of people who live in those houses. So how does the Stevens Point Housing Authority really intentionally address those diversity, um, equity, and and inclusion issues in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so one thing um, that we do in terms of, I, I guess diversity is like when people apply to housing is not, I, I believe in the past, we used to based on language access and things like that, like if it was a certain group of people, they would probably live somewhere in a certain place. But now when people apply, we kind of like disperse them equally throughout the city of Stevens Point based on their household size. Um, another thing that we do is making sure that tenants who have, which is related to equity and inclusion is making sure tenants who have um, language, um, they speak another language, making sure we CAP services, I believe has a language translation services that we've used in the past and we continue to use. And then also just trying to make sure if there are some tenants where English is in their first language, trying to see if we could send the communication um, in the second language or obtaining 
um, a service where uh, someone could translate for that particular tenant. And that's just important for us to make sure that we're being inclusive to all types of, um, to, to all of our clients who, whose um, language, for example, may not be, um, their first language may not be English. Um, so those are, those are just examples of um, things that we do in terms of like inclusion um, um, on a language access side, especially. <laughs> what are ways that individuals learn about your services and, mm -hmm. and come to be working with the housing authority? Yeah, so a lot of people through word of mouth, that's one way that people learn about Stevens Point Housing Authority. Um, we also um, promote, we have a website as well. We are in like the United Way directory and then the ADRC um, directory as well. Um, and then we just encourage people who, uh, who call us and they mention that they're interested in affordable housing. We always encourage them to submit an application. Um, and then sometimes we get, uh, people who may come from neighboring towns like Wisconsin Rapids or in Walsall, and they could be other agencies or other housing authorities um, that would inform them about our agency. And that's also another way that people come to find out. But I do want to point out that when people apply, it's not immediate housing because we normally have a 98% or higher um, occupancy rate. So our vacancy is really low. So how it works is that when people apply, they get put on a wait list. Um, and then when their number is reached on the wait list from previous tenants who, who move out, then we call them back. So that's something that I, I always like to point out because sometimes when people apply <laughs> um, for housing, they think it's immediate. And unfortunately, we don't provide immediate housing as a process um, that we have to go through. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's a really good point because typically we don't think about needing housing until for whatever reason we don't have housing available. Exactly. For you know, that next thing within weeks or days sometimes, and um, that's not the point. So um, ha to have people have the foresight <laughs> Um, to, to need that might be a bit of a challenge for you to address, I'm sure. Um, so let's say a, a client is, is in need mm -hmm. and, and they've applied to you and you're like, what do you mean you can't help me? How do you navigate that rather than just saying, oh, sorry, we're putting you on a wait list? Okay. In what ways do you help them um, figure out their next steps? Yeah, so we do. So there's a other there's another agency that sometimes people confuse with. Our agency is called Portage County Housing Authority. So they're a little unique where not well, not unique, but they're a different type of agency where they issue Section 8 vouchers for um, low to moderate income individuals and families to live in the private landlord market. So sometimes we refer um, tenants to them. We also, if they're either 60 and above or disabled, we may refer them as well to the ADRC. And then there's a couple of affordable housing, um, multifamily housing throughout Stevens Point um, where it's affordable and the rent is based on your income. So we'll let them know as well that these are other places um, that you can apply for. And our wait list varies. So sometimes it could be as short as six months up to maybe 24 months. But if, um, if people are interested in media housing, we do let them know about other resources that are available and technically they should kind of apply to all the different programs that are available to them. And whoever reaches out to them first is the one that they should pursue. Um, and just, and we just kind of let them know that this is the process. And um, unfortunately we don't provide immediate housing, but we do have a wait list that moves. It's not always stagnant because we do have families who move. They may move out of town. For example, one tenant um, has a new job in Wausau. So that's a new household that's um, a new, unit that's going to become available very soon. And we also inform people to always um, keep us up to date because another thing that we face is that when we do reach out to clients, maybe their phone number or contact information has changed. And then um, we just keep moving down the wait list. So if you haven't informed us of like your new contact information, that could be a missed opportunity. So we also inform people who are interested to just give us a call back every few months, make sure your contact information is up to date in our system so that when your number is reached, um, that we can reach you successfully. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, we definitely try to inform them about other programs available locally as well. 
again, those those collaborations and partnerships. You also mentioned the ADRC, and we had Cindy Petrowski oh, um, yes. mm -hmm. as well. So I love how all of these things are are linked and and again working together to benefit our community. Uh, what what would you say that you have seen as being some of those those barriers and obstacles for individuals um, in our our Stevens Point community to access housing? Um, as you've worked with families and residents, what do you see that some of their issues are and, and how might we meet, we address some of those concerns? Okay, sometimes issues that come up when people apply for housing because we are federally funded and federally regulated is a lot of times people may not, and it's more administrative, people may not have the documentation that's needed to move forward to the next step. Like for example, birth certificate is a needed document. And you know, you know how federal agencies, or when you're funded federally, you have all these requirements that you must meet. So maybe not having their birth certificate or having their social security card. So I always always tell people, like when you apply, just make sure you get these documents in order in advance so that if we do reach your number on the wait list, we could just move the process really quickly from us calling you to you actually moving in. So that could be extremely extremely helpful um, and just having all the documentation um, that you need, not only for yourself, but for any other family member that's listed on your housing application. Um, so th those are the usual hurdles that keeps, that stalls the process significantly is when people don't have the correct documentation once we do reach their number. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I, I can empathize with individuals not having documentation. I um, last year got my star ID and that really took some effort to have all of my documents lined up for something that I thought was pretty simple. So um, I think people tend to take those things for granted and we also think it's easier to do and not realizing the time and, and how to access those things. Um, exactly. So, Good advice for everyone. Have all those documents in line because you never know when you really need them. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and it could be good for an emergency as well, something, you know, and have them electronically. That's another tip because a lot of people have hard copies, but God forbid there was a fire or anything. It's always good to, you know, have them electronically just in case. <laughs> yes. So yes, great advice for everyone. Um, You've only been in your role for, as you said, just kind of over a year and yes. in an unusual circumstance, but <laughs> um, what would you say are some of the key lessons that you've learned about Stevens Point and about the people who live here? Yeah, so one of the things that I've learned um, locally is that there are a lot of different programs um, and services available to help people. One of the hurdles though, is that people don't necessarily know how to access programs um, and that's, you know, kind of my role when I come across new initiative, for example, they have the emergency rental assistance program, they have energy services. So people sometimes are aware, but they don't know, necessarily know like how to navigate all the different services and programs that are available. Um, so that's, that's kind of like a benefit, but what, for our tenants, that could be a hurdle because like they, they exist, but they don't know how to access it. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed is that there is assistance um, for most tenants needs is just trying to find out how to obtain that assistance and who to go to exactly for that assistance can be the hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, well, you noted that assistance is available. Do you find that individuals are sometimes resistant? Sometimes. To yeah, sometimes. Um, sometimes they feel like, oh, other people could benefit from the service more than I can. And that's where our staff will come into place and be like, this is something you're eligible for. It's gonna help your situation. You don't have to feel a certain way or feel bad because you need assistance. Um, you're eligible. Um, a lot of these programs are grant funded to be even to, to be able to assist individuals like you. So we encourage you to take advantage. So definitely for some people, um, not everyone, but for some of our tenants, that could definitely be a hurdle um, where they feel that, you know, other people can benefit from the service more than that, more than they can. Um, so we just try to encourage them and say, no, you're also eligible. You meet the requirements. So this is something that you should take advantage of. It will benefit your household. Mm -hmm. I know historically there's 
there's been stigmas that are mm -hmm. attached to people accessing resources. Yes. So um, what are some other ways that you might help people um, work past that? Um, that it's like, I, I don't want to use that service because people will think this of me, or mm -hmm. I will be judged differently because I'm using this this particular resource. Um, any mm -hmm. other uh, tips you could give people or how we can help move mm -hmm. past those, those viewpoints? Yeah, so definitely one thing that we, well, and during the pandemic, we kind of limited this, but now we're opening our offices to visit. So sometimes we'll be willing to sit down one-on-one -on -one with clients, explain the process, maybe help them fill out the application for whatever service that they're interested in. And then I think sometimes having that like one-on-one -on -one assistance really helps because sometimes when you just pass along information, people feel intimidated, but when you kind of explain the process to them, um, that's also very helpful to make sure that, okay, they all their questions are answered. Um, they start to feel at ease um, and then they move forward with the next step. So that was like the pandemic, you know, kind of stalled a lot of the, in the, the one-on-one -on -one assistance, but now we're starting to, when clients come to the front office, if they need more one-on-one -on -one assistance, we'll take them to the individual office and meet with them. So that's something that um, we're, we're doing. And we did, we um, did it in the past, but it was stalled. So I think that really helps because a lot of times people are just intimidated um, and they're scared, but when they have like that one-on-one -on -one assistance, it helps alleviate um, at least some of their concerns. <laughs> It's always about creating relationships and, and certainly building trust, um, knowing that you are there to help and that you want to help um, is, is a real a key factor. So I think, yeah, that personalization and one on one can can make a big difference. Um, what are some ways that maybe our students can become involved um, in in similar kinds of work or in related um, work? Yeah, and that's something um, that we're trying. So we do have a site at Madison View that we've used for the Boys and Girls Summer Camp. Unfortunately, it's not operating this summer. Um, but in the past, we operated maybe before my time. So this was a couple of years ago, maybe four or five years ago. We operated like a homework center at our community center site. And that's something that we hope to um to, to start up again or to even do other services and programs um, to benefit um, our tenants. Um, so it's still in the works, but that's probably one way that if someone has an idea or if they're looking to do more one-on-one -on -one assistance with um, clients, a lot of our tenants who live at that complex, they have children um, as well. Um, in the past, I believe the homework center mm -hmm had volunteers from UWSP, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we're just looking and we're exploring creative ways to be able to use that space um, throughout the year on more um, tenant services and resident services. Um, so if someone's interested in doing more like one-on-one -on -one, um, work or practicums, they could reach out to me and we could, you know, figure out, you know, maybe an innovative project, even if it's for a couple of months um, to work on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so in your role, what are some of the goals that you have uh, for your, your work as executive mm -hmm. director? What kind, can you share a little of your strategic plan um, yeah. moving forward? Yeah, definitely. So one thing on is on the technology aspect, um, trying to revamp our website um, and just become having a Facebook page because we are a small agency and in the past we didn't have a lot of like online presence. So that's something that's in the works for me is just having more presence and obviously website and social media presence. Um, I think that's key. Uh, definitely um, implementing um, resident services program and making sure that in addition to implementing that we're not working in silos, that we're working working with other agencies um, that exist in the community, such as CAP Services or uh, Sherry Daniels Organization and ADRC, and making sure all those different organizations, um, our tenants are connected to those different organizations. So that's key. And another thing is also increasing home ownership opportunities. It's not for everyone because we, we only provide rental housing, but there are some tenants of ours who are interested in owning their own home. So ideally we would like to um, promote the Hoover program more and to have more tenants pursue home ownership opportunities once they're um, ready to leave rental housing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, being a homeowner is a big responsibility. <laughs> it's, 
it's not something that everybody wants to tackle. Um, so I, I love that you said, you know, when they're ready, that you're not pushing people because some people exactly. don't want to actually own because it's easier to have someone else responsible for those. Yeah, exactly. And it's not a, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not a task for everyone, especially some of our elderly tenants um, as well at a certain age, you may be like, I'm okay renting. We, I call, I make my maintenance requests, my, <laughs> everything is fixed and yeah. So, but it's for some people, that's what I said. And we, we always, we don't encourage, um, people to move out. It's their personal decision to make. <laughs> That's important. Um, I think recognizing the needs and the desires of the people that you serve is, is a big part of that. Any other things that you want to share with us about the housing authority or how um, you have been framing your work through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I would, I would, one thing I would say about um, public housing sometimes, like you've mentioned before, there's sometimes a stigma associated with public housing or affordable housing in general um, that people shouldn't feel shame. We provide good housing, it's safe, it's affordable, it's, um, it's nice as well. Um, and the benefit, like I mentioned before, is just your rent is based on um, your rent is based on your income. So people shouldn't feel like, oh, it's only for certain types of people, because that could be a lot of the stigma that's associated with, oh, it's only for these type of people. It's not for, it's not for me. Um, but when you, you look at the income guidelines for people who are eligible, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty high. So there are a lot of um, income there are a lot of household types who 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 are eligible um to live in in public housing slash affordable housing um so that's one thing i would just like to emphasize um in terms of sometimes the stigma associated that you shouldn't feel a certain way about um you know living in affordable housing it's a benefit um and it's a benefit that sometimes people in the private market would, would like where your rent is is affordable and you don't have to worry about it increasing every year <laughs> i think one of the other things that stuck out to me that you mentioned is is how the housing is is spread out around the community in different types. I, th I think that's one of the other misconceptions that people mm -hmm. sometimes have about affordable housing is it's only that area and that type of, of home. Um, and, and so, you know, to help people get past some of those, those preconceived notions or, or maybe what you've only seen in a movie <laughs> or a, yeah, how it's exactly. represented in media. Exactly, exactly. That's awesome. Um, any recommendations or advice you have for our students as they pursue careers in, in working in their communities? Um, I do love that you've given us some, some knowledge nuggets about having our documents all lined up because we never know when we're gonna need them. Um, but any other things that students might be able to do to prepare themselves to be able to work in communities addressing various needs? Yeah, I would definitely say one ben, um, one advice um, is to just have that like on the ground experience, whether you want to work with children or whether you want to work with, um, you know, on the economic side, people who have limited means, having that direct um, experience is really helpful. Um, and also just um, listening, I guess, just listening to people, um, to people and their concerns. Sometimes I think we're quick to and I'm guilty of this to offer advice or offer help and be like, oh, this is who you could go to. And then sometimes people just need like a listening board, uh, not like, oh, because I'm 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 definitely guilty where I'm like, well, there's a list of resources available. This is where you could go to get those resources. But sometimes I realize too that can be overwhelming for some people. So you have to kind of like meet people where they are. Um and just understand like what are their needs. And then sometimes people have a variety of different needs depending on their household situation. And then sometimes you may just need to address the most pressing or the most important need and other things you would address later. So that that I think that could be really helpful for people who work in human services is that you have the, um, usually people who work in this field, they have the, I, like, I wanna help, I wanna help. And it's helpful, but I real, I'm also realizing that could be overwhelming for some people. And sometimes you just gotta start with one task whatever is most important, figure out that particular situation and then move on to like, okay, now you figured out this situation, whether it was childcare, whether it was obtaining a job, 
or whatever have you, you figured out that situation. And once that's taken care of, now we could see like, okay, what other um, assistance do you need? So sometimes you may need to do it step by step as opposed to like, okay, let's help you with, you know, <laughs> the whole alphabet from A to Z. And that can be a, a little overwhelming. And then also realizing that people's time is important because it, when you give them a lot of resources and especially if they're working, you know, a lot of these agencies are usually just open during business hours. So then people have to navigate that. So, um, so that's one thing I would say for people who work in human services is there's a need to always help, which is great, but sometimes um, just meeting people where they are. <laughs> That's terrific advice. And I, I love that, you know, people may have a, a multitude of concerns, but to tackle that, prioritize them and, and mm -hmm. take them one at a time. Otherwise, sometimes it can just feel, like you said, overwhelming and crushing when you're trying to do too much. It's like, well, there's no way that I'm going to be able to do all of this. So I'm just not going to try to do any of it. And I exactly. think that that's, that's great. If you can help them with one thing, it's like, oh, I've had some success. I can do this and now we can, we can continue forward. So um, not, not trying to rush to help either. And, and listening is, is so important. Um, I think many of us are, are quick. We're like, oh, you should do this and this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but take it slow. Take it slow. And people have to want to receive the help too, because I'm guilty where I'm like, oh no, you must do this. This is going to help you. And then the other person is not receptive to it. And then sometimes you have to realize you may not be able to help everyone because if you're trying to help someone that doesn't want to be helped, you're, you're going to, you're going to hit a wall. <laughs> so sometimes you, you know, it's unfortunate because when you're in this field, you always want to help people, but you have to also make sure that the help, um, the, the, the other person wants to receive the help and that they're receptive to receiving whatever assistance you're offering. <laughs> yes. And if, again, that reminder of meeting people where they are is, is important. Mm -hmm. If they're not ready for that assistance or aren't interested in it, then that's not where they are. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, thank you for that reminder. I think that's really key. Well, it's been great to be able to meet you um, and have the students put a, a face and a name and to know a little bit more about the organization and, and potentially reaching out um, to partner or if they know someone who may need those services or they themselves need those services. I think it's really important to be aware um, because a lot of times people just don't even know, um, you know, they might see an organization name, but not really know what they do or, or how yeah. they can help. So mm -hmm. we appreciate the opportunity to learn more about you, as well as the Stevens Point Housing Authority. So thanks for taking time with us today. Thank you so much. All right.